Sit down, gentlemen. Is Mr. Ponyan here? Not yet, Your Worship. He's on his way. Miss Mado, let's wait for the language practitioner, Mr. Ponyani. Here. Just wait, Mr. Tetsi, waiting for Mr. Ponyan. Is it gone missing? <laughs> is it gone missing? He was on the third floor. So easy. I left him in the office, Your Worship. He's close on his
ya move in ndani Should I join? <laughs> Because hmm. I don't know what's going to happen. Hmm. I guess so. Yeah. Mr. Bazan, I'm going to join. You will contact me when he comes here. <laughs> okay, quite a joins then. The matter was adjourned for today or for the judgment to be brought before this honorable court by the court in terms of the application which was made before this honorable court in terms of the refusal in terms of the magistrate judge. State is ready to proceed as well as the defense of the court judges. Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> My judgment is quite lengthy. Um, I have to also give Mr. Ponyani the opportunity to translate to the accused before the court. So I will take it as low as I can take it. All right then, judgment then in the application for my recusal. There's an application for my recusal in this matter, particularly in respect of any bail application proceeding is concerned. I'm only seized with the bail application issues and not the trial. The said recusal application was brought by the state on the 9th of September 2024 and this is prior to the court hearing the bail application on new facts which the applicants in the main matter intend to bring. Yes, Mr. Ponyane? The defense in this matter is vehemently opposing the said application for my recusal as they have submitted that this application is merely brought to frustrate the court with its, dispensing, with, its, with its dispensing and administration of justice and furthermore that there is no basis for this application. They also emphasize that the said application is a deliberate stunt to use the presiding officer to delay the case which is in turn prejudicing their clients as their right to liberty hangs in the balance. The golden nugget of this application rests on the testimony of the witness that was led by the state being Mr. Vilagazi. Mr. Ramavoya is representing the state and the defense, which is led by Advocate Lamini. As I have said about, they are opposing the said application. Now the issues that have to be decided is whether has the state being the litigant bringing this application made out a case for my recusal. In bringing the said application, the state led the evidence of Mr. Vilagazi, who was the public prosecutor in the initial bail application of the main case. I do not wish to repeat his testimony as same is on record, but I must provide his evidence as it forms the basis 
of the said application. It is common cause that he dealt with the bail application. It is common cause that I delivered the bail the judgment on the bail application on the 19th of August 2024. It is common cause that I denied the said bail application for accused number one and two in the said matter. The witness for the state testified that he does not know what transpired on the 28th of August in terms of our case number one. In the main application, appeared before court on the day and no one arranged anything with him on the, on the said date. He testified that on the 19th of August 2024, the day when the judgment for the bail application was delivered, after the said case was heard and, 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 as, as, he, and as he was packing his belongings in the presence of the accused legal representatives, I instructed him to call the legal representatives in chambers and therefore he heard that I mentioned that the legal representative must fix their papers and bring an application on new facts. It is also further his testimony that this was said in a general conversation as all the participants were present. When I say all the participants, the court refers to the court leg, the language practitioner, the court orderly, and the crime prevention wardens. <laughs> He testified that the invitation was not extended to him and that he does not know what, whether the said meeting took place or not. In his own words, he stated that, I'm not sure if there was dialogue. He further testified that the said legal representatives of accused in the main matter met him after the said bail application hearing, and that to him showed that there was an indication of dialogue, although not certain, as the legal representative informed him he is intending to bring bail application on new facts. <laughs> He then, in his testimony, moved to the date of the 2nd of September, where he stated that he had communication with me in my chambers as I was in the process of moving offices. He indicated in short that he was not alone and he met me in chambers where he asked me about the bail application on UFEX and that is when I said that he should not worry about it as his colleague would do it and I asked him why was he being harsh on Mr. Mutuini. He further testified that it was a light conversation but the words I allegedly uttered raised a concern to him as it was not necessary to make such comments. In that they gave a negative impression. It was his testimony that he informed the investigating officer and that they filed a formal complaint. <laughs> Thank you.
During cross examination of the state witness, Ms. Villagazin, he confirmed that he did not know about the date of the 2nd of September as there were no arrangements made with him. He informed the court that he did not see the need to approach me after having this problem did not see the need to approach his seniors, however, reported the matter to the police. He was probed in whether I uttered the comment out of the blue. He answered in the affirmative, but cannot remember how the conversation started. He was asked whether they forced him to do anything against his will. He said no. He expressed to the court that my perpetrated conduct was leaning or showing prejudice to the other, and I was not impartial. He further said that it would not have been wise for him to approach me. It was put to him that he, this whole issue was to waste the accused time, and he denied saying it is his testimony that he failed to describe the said attorney but mentioned that it was the briefing attorney. It was further put to him that he had a duty to approach the court when the court called for the attorney, but deliberately did not do so. That is why he's bringing the state application. He denied saying. <laughs> It was further put to him whether it was justifiable for a presiding officer to recuse herself due to the maladministration of the state. The state witness did not provide an answer. It was further put to him that the comment made by me on the day was what I experienced as same was said in my judgment, and the state witness says it was not so. Sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Yenne. It was further put to him whether it was justifiable for a presiding officer to recuse herself due to the male administration of the state. The state witness did not provide an answer. It was further put to him that the comment made by me on the day was what I experienced as same was said in my judgment, and the state witness says said it was not so. The court now looks at the jurisprudence pertaining to recusal. The court is privileged as it is guided by a plethora of cases that have canvassed the issue of recusal. As it is the common law principle that no one should be a judge in his or her own case, that is the, that is, this is the basis upon which the rule against bias or apprehension of bias was founded. It is also pertinent to mention that whenever the issue of recusal, recusal rears its head, the two very important experts arises. The first one being the presumption of judicial impartiality, which has been described as a cornerstone of our legal system. <laughs> And the second test that to be applied to determine the circumstances in which a recusal, a recusal application should succeed okay. or fail. Now, the seminal case of the President of the Republic of South Africa versus South African Rugby Football Union, the test for recusal was succinctly formulated, and it was stated, it was stated, stated that the question is whether a reasonable, objective, and informed person would, on the correct facts, reasonably apprehend that the judge has not or will not 
bring an impartial mind to bear on the adjudication of the case that is a mind open to persuasion by the evidence and the submissions of counsel. The, reasonables, the reasonableness of the apprehension must be assessed in the light of the oath of office taken by the judges to administer justice without fear or favor and their, and their ability to carry out that oath by reason of their training and experience. It must be assumed that they can disabuse their minds of any irrelevant personal beliefs or predispositions. They must take into account the fact that they have a duty to sit in any case in which they are not obliged to recuse themselves. At the same time, it must never be forgotten that an impartial judge is the fundamental prerequisite for a fair trial, and a judicial officer must a judicial officer should not hesitate to recuse him or herself if there are reasonable grounds on the part of a litigant for apprehending that the judicial officer, for whatever reasons, was not or will not be impartial. Close quote. I further refer to the case of Sakao versus Ivan and Johnson Limited, where the court stated that the grounds for recusal require either A, proof that a judicial officer is actually biased, or B, an apprehension of bias on the part of the judicial officer, and whether such apprehension is that of a reasonable, objective, or informed person based on the correct facts of bias on the part of the judicial officer. Close quote. <laughs> Section 165 of the Constitution unequivocally reassures the public that judicial officers are deemed to be impartial when dispensing with the judicial functions and or duties. Section 1652 emphasizes that the courts are independent and subject only to the Constitution and the law, which they must impartially and without fear, favor, or prejudice. This section is jointly read with Section 8, 1, and Section 34, and Section 35 of the Constitution. As a then Chief Justice Nobo expressed in the case of Bennett versus Absa Bank, the presumption of impartiality and the double requirements of reasonableness, the presumption of impartiality is implicit, if not explicit, in the office of a judicial officer. This presumption must be understood in the context of the oath of office that judicial, of, that judicial officers are required to take, as well as the nature of the judicial function. Judicial officers are required by the Constitution to apply the Constitution and the law, impartially and without fear, favor, prejudice. Their oath of office requires them to administer justice to all persons alike, without fear, favor, or prejudice, in accordance with the Constitution and the law. And the requirement of impartiality is, is implicit and if not explicit in Section 34 of the Constitution, which guarantees the right to have disputes decided. In a fair public hearing before a court or where appropriate, another independent impartial tribunal or forum, 
This presumption therefore flows directly from the Constitution. As is apparent from the Constitution, the very nature of the judicial function requires judicial officers to be impartial. Therefore, the authority of the judicial process depends upon the presumption of impartiality. <laughs> Now, application of the legal principles to the facts. Before I delve into applying the legal principles discussed above, I would, however, like to address the procedure that was followed regarding this application. The Constitutional Court in the SAFU case informs us that the usual procedure in applications for recusal, recusal is that counsel for the applicant seeks a meeting in chambers with the judge or judges in the presence of her or his opponent. The grounds for recusal are put to the judge who would, have given, who would be given an opportunity if sought to respond to them. In the event of recusal being refused by the judge, the applicant would, if so advised, move the application in open court. In this case, the procedure, the procedure used by the state significantly deviates from the established practice. No attempt was made to engage with me, either in writing or in chambers, before the application for my recusal was presented. I was not provided with an opportunity to evaluate the reasons for my, for my recusal, nor was I given the chance to present any facts on record. Be that as it may, the facts relied upon by the state or the inferences sought to be relied upon are drawn from the evidence of the state witness, Mr. Villagas. <laughs> I agree with the Apex Court when they said that, and I quote, at the very outset, we wish to acknowledge that a litigant and her or his counsel will find it necessary to apply for the recusal of a judicial officer has an unavailable task and the propriety of their motives should not lightly be questioned. Where the grounds are reasonable, it is counsel's duty to advance the grounds without fear. On the part of the judge whose recusal is sought, there should be a full appreciation of the admonition that he or she should not be unduly sensitive and ought not to regard an application for his or her recusal as a personal affront. Close quote. It is evidently clear that the state applied for my recusal in this matter in that they say I've shown an appreciation of bias as per the testimony of the state witness, Mr. Villagazi. They therefore want to disqualify, disqualify me to hear the pending bail application on new facts, and therefore should I do so, I will be prejudicing the state. It is also correct that the judicial officers enjoy and have jurisdiction to determine applications for their own recusal, 
and if the judicial officer, after having dealt with the recusal application and refuses such application, and it is found that the decision was incorrect, this can always be corrected on an appeal. From the pub. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to speak louder. It is evidently clear that the state applied for my recusal in this matter, in that they say, I have shown an apprehension of bias as per the testimony of the state witness, Mr. Villagazi. They therefore want to disqualify me to hear the pending bail application on new facts, and therefore should I do so, I will be prejudicing the state. It is also correct that judicial officers enjoy and have jurisdiction to determine applications for their own recusal, and if the judicial officer, after having dealt with the recusal application and refuses such application, and it is found that the decision was incorrect, this can always be corrected on an appeal. In as much as I was not afforded an opportunity to evaluate the reasons for my recusal and in evaluating the evidence of the state witness, the court is then expected to address the said allegations or, in this context, the said evidence presented. However, I am of the view that I can only maneuver within the framework of the evidence presented, which is quite limiting. The said evaluation is against the backdrop of the test laid out in the SAFU case. <laughs> I reiterate Judge Kuhn's sentiments found in the case of S versus Zuma in another, and this is found in paragraph 28 of his judgment that, and I quote, our law does not insist on the proof of actual bias on the part of a judge. The appearance or a reasonable apprehension of bias, if proved, is enough to vitiate the proceedings. As has been said, the court will not inquire whether the judge did in fact favor one side unfairly, where the allegation is reasonable apprehension. Where the, the impartiality of a judge is in question, the appearance of the matter is as important as the reality. Thus, it is no answer for the judge to say that he is in fact impartial, that he abided by judicial oath and there was a fair trial. The administration of justice must be preserved from any suspicion that a judge lacks independence or that he is not impartial. If there are grounds which would be sufficient to create in the mind of a reasonable man a doubt about the judge's impartiality, the inevitable result is that the judge is disqualified from taking any further part in the case. No further investigation is necessary and any decisions he may have he may have made cannot stand. Close quote. <laughs> Now, 
Did the state discharge the owners that rest on them that Mr. Villacaz's apprehension of bias is a reasonable one? His testimony rests on three incidences, which was the day of the said bail application, the incident when the accused number one appeared before court without a requisition, and the last incident that he, ha that he said happened on the 2nd of September 2024. Again, I don't want to descend into the arena of he said, she said, as I was not given an opportunity to address the said application due to the state adopting a bizarre procedure that is vastly different from the one laid down in our legal jurisprudence. But it is imperative to correct the state witness in providing the accurate proceeding which may well vitiate his testimony or show the lack of merit in the state's application. Now this court is a court of record. What happens in it is duly recorded, be it mechanically or on the charge sheet or both. I turn now to the first incident of the 19th of August 2024. It is rather surprising that the state witness, Mr. Villagazi, informs this court that the, conversa the conversation that took place was in an open court with court staff present. He conveniently removes himself from this participation of what is termed by him a general discussion amongst colleagues. Now, it is not unusual or uncanny for a court to repeat findings which was read onto the record, whether verbatim or in general conversation, after having heard the matter. He therefore paints a picture to this court that something wrong happened which it did not. It is also strange that he would say, I invited the legal practitioner to my chambers in full view of the court and its court staff when he and when when and the invitation was not extended to him. This court will not allow the state witness to distort what transpired and what did not transpire to formulate an ill considered narrative. There is no basis for the court to make such a comment. <laughs> It is further by his own version that he is not sure whether the court met with the defense legal representative. Therefore, it is safe to conclude that he or is or was speculating an objective person or should I state that an individual of his professional caliber would in the least provide evidence to support his assertion. I mean, it is common cause that his tools of trade and of functions is to provide irrefutable proof when he fulfills his duties. But in this case, he operates on speculation. It was put to him in cross-examination that he knew about the date of the 2nd of September. He denied same. However, 
It is important to note that in his testimony, he mentioned that the legal representative of the accused kept on coming to his court and omitting him to discuss the intention to bring bail application on new facts. Again, this is rather peculiar to even try to reconcile his denial, but then concession of the same fact. It is further not in dispute that I had taken leave of absence from office when this conversation of intending to bring a bail application that he speaks of. I cannot fathom how I would then conspire such a plan. <laughs> He tells the court that by the accused appearing on the 28th of August 2024 without his knowledge and or requisition, it then satisfied himself that the purported comments made by myself on the 19th of August 2024 justified the appearance of accused number one. I have stated, I have stated above that this court is a court of record. It is therefore prudent to appraise the state witness, Mr. Villagazi, with the facts of the incident of the 28th of August 2024. As he correctly testified that District Court No. 3 is not his court and he was in his court in D.C. 1. It is also common cause that the state witness is not the resident public prosecutor of D.C. 3. The events of that day were just as bizarre to the then court officials of D.C. 3. Accused No. 1 appeared before this court without a warrant of detention, a J7, or a requisition form which in the normal course is duly completed by the state. The court inquired from the resident public prosecutor of DC3 as to why the anomaly. There was no answer provided. The court record is reflected in the charge sheet stating that there is no reasons advanced why the court, the accused, is before the court today. And a signed requisition form was requested by the court. Till today, it has not been provided. I must note that the legal representative recorded on the charge sheet on behalf of accused number one on the 28th of August is not the same legal representative who have handled this matter since its inception. <laughs> So based on the mail administration on the side of the state, on that day, the state witness wants to paint the picture that the court orchestrated that incident. So that satisfied him that there is a reasonable apprehension of bias. <laughs> Now the third incident of the 2nd of September 2024, he states that he was in the company of the legal aid practitioner of his court when he passed by my chambers, and I uttered the said comment. It raises suspicion that the state witness of his professional caliber does not call the said person he states that he was with on the day. It must be noted that in did so, I was moving chambers. It was also necessary to point out that the state witnessed selective amnesia. amnesia. 
He tells us that he approached me and inquired about the bail application on new facts that he knew nothing about as the date was not arranged with him. But all communication was canvassed with his colleague of the district court number three. How then does the court grant him indulgence when he sought a postponement last week to readily prepare the bail application that was to be held on the 9th of September if it is his testimony that I uttered the words, do not worry about it, your colleague will do it, it is not a big deal. Would the court not have then insisted on the day that his colleague proceed with the matter on the 2nd of September if something was underhanded or sinister? It then questions his evidence that I uttered the words, why is he being harsh or to the accused? There is no basis, no merit to this submission, as it is evident that the state witness sought to purport or cook a narrative that is an apprehension of bias on the side of the court. The conduct of the state witness following the said incidences and who the said incidences and who he, and who he reported the matter to and failing to approach me and or his seniors really leaves us all here questioning his motives. I will not be labor on that point because the cross examination of the defense exposes the shortcomings of the state witness. It is clear that the state witness apprehension is not reasonable. It is, is, it is not objective and it is not based on the correct facts. I would have taken no issue but to recuse myself if the evidence presented before the court by the state was reasonable and objectively showed that I may be biased going forth with the bail proceedings. I concur and agree with Mr. Ramavoya in his submissions that an application for recusal is a very uncomfortable exercise because indeed so, I must take a magnifying glass and thoroughly examine my alleged conduct. <laughs> What makes this exercise extremely uncomfortable is that the evidence provided has cast doubt on the integrity, credibility, and judicial independence of the court. The same integrity which is provided, promoted, and protected by the Constitution. The said impugning of the court further fuels and perpetuates the narrative that the public will not have confidence that the courts are independent and impartial. I must add that it is the prerogative of any litigant to bring in a, the said application, but same should be carefully considered as the provision of Section 1652 of the Constitution are sacrosanct to any judicial officer who have taken the judicial oath of office. Mobile at two, Banadi, Hitum, Hotabana, and Molita Missano, Hotabana, and Molita Missano, 
I refer to the article to Article 2.5 of the Bangalore Principle of Judicial Conduct, which states that a judge shall disqualify himself or herself from participating in any proceedings in which the judge is unable to decide the matter impartially or in which it may appear to a reasonable observer that the judge is unable to decide the matter impartially. This is echoed in Article 13 of our country's um, the Code of Judicial Conduct of judges which stipulates that a judge must recuse him, him or herself from a case if there is A, real or reasonably perceived conflict of interest, or B, reasonable suspicion of bias based upon objective facts and shall not disqualify him or himself or herself based on trivial or insufficient grounds. This is the same standard equally applicable to magistrates. <laughs> It is also surprising that the state would forthwith bring this application when they have been successful in all their in all their endeavors with this matter. Their defense submit that the state is deliberately frustrating that their client and that this application exposes the male administration on the state's part. They are correct to the state that the presiding officer should not be used as a tool to settle scores. The court is dumbfounded by this application. It is also pertinent to remind the state witness, Mr. Villagazi, of his oath of office. He is a legal practitioner, and therefore his powers, duties, and functions are regulated by the National Prosecuting Authority Act, as well as their, legis the, as well as their legislative policies. Furthermore, the Code of Conduct for all legal practitioners highlights the expected standard required by same. To mention just one, Article 3.1 of the said Code of Conduct requires a legal practitioner to maintain the highest standards of honesty and integrity. The court expects legal practitioners to, in executing their duties to uphold the values and objectives found in the said Code of Conduct for legal practitioners. I do not expect less from the state witness, Mr. Villagazi, as he has a duty to fulfill. <laughs> I am joined by my oath of I am enjoined by my oath of office to adjudicate cases and ministers' justice without fear, favor, or prejudice, and it shall not be dissuaded or be prevented, and I shall not be dissuaded or be prevented from doing so based on unsatisfactory evidence that they have that have been provided by the state. Public perception is of paramount importance as they might as they might as they must be left with the reassurance that the court remains impartial and maintains its judicial integrity. I am reminded of the Sipedi idiom that perfectly describes the position that the state witness, Mr Villagazi, has placed me in. Loosely translated that I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't. <laughs>
I therefore conclude that the state with the evidence they've presented have not discharged the owners resting upon them to show that the apprehension of buyers is reasonable. And I also conclude that the double requirement of reasonableness, that the application of the recusal test in port is not discharged. The application for my recusal is hereby dismissed. Yes, Ms. Mudal. The defense was intending to prevail on no censorship. Mm -hmm. However, as much as I was not the resident prosecutor in terms of this matter, nothing was liased to me. I just had it in passing. So I don't know um, at this point in time whether the defense stands before we proceed. Thank you, Your Worship. Are you proceeding or? We are proceeding, Your Worship. Ms. Madam. As the court pleases, Your Worship, um, after the judgment that have been brought before this honorable court in terms of the application of the court, Your Worship, Mr. Villagazui was the one that was dealing with this matter. I just was interjected to jump in and take over at this point in time. But however, not for me to proceed with a formal bail application motion to begin for the judgment which has to be laid before the Honorable Court by the President. I don't know now because on Monday, Mr. Ramavuya, there was consensus, consensus from the state mm. and the defense that no matter how either I, I recuse myself or I do not recuse myself, we will proceed today. And Mr. Ramavuya said they stated that you will then proceed. Mr. Villagazi has fallen off the case. As the court pleases, so, um, yes, indeed, that should be what has been said at the side of the office of the MPA motion, that the matter will proceed to the motion. All right. On mm. that note, your worship, state the request this honorable court to take a short adjournment to motion. I see it's so half past 12. Our housing order. I see it's half past 12. I don't know <laughs> what time do I come back? Are we going to work through lunch? I don't know what's the arrangement. Your Worship, she has not uh, given time the adjournment. We need to know, is it uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes uh, to deal with that aspect? Uh, we cannot take too long. Uh, that's the, the issue that we place on record. So if you give us time to say adjournment, for this time. Ms. Mudawi in the hot seat. <laughs> you will have to tell us. Your, your, your Worship, it is yes. also a concern that keeps on repeating itself. And we are, we are going to have the same case again, whereby we'll come here late, be left with only 30 minutes to present our case and be told that there is no time. They must take the accused back to the cell or anything. That's why we are insisting on saying how long do they need for them to tell us to adjourn. We need to know the period of time because if not so, it's going to be the same issue repeating itself of us being delayed. I don't want to dictate because I say it's half past 12. I've got no issue working through lunch. Uh, you will just inform me. I come back and proceed. The state is Dominus Leaders. They must tell us. Ms. Mudao, you said that you've just been thrown into this case so I don't know how long you will need but I also hear the defense's submissions that we can't repeat what's been happening. It's not fair on behalf of the accused and also not fair on the state as well. Definitely, so your worship, on top of that, I cannot stipulate. Yes. So, you, I don't know. Will I be called or what? We'll do so, your worship, as usual, when we're about to start, we'll call the, 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 the magistrate to be before the Sonoma Court and we'll process. Maybe let's set timelines. Is that fair? That we don't, wander, that we don't wander into the darkness and just not know. I will cause hands, your worship. As I stated, I've placed that. I've got no pro If you come back at 1 o'clock, I've got no issue. You can come back at 1 o'clock. If you come back at 2 o'clock, I've got no issue. You can come back at 2 o'clock. You will just inform me.
Des êtes faits. All right, then the court will take a short adjournment. Court adjourns.